Got your Bibles. Let me see those, please. Hold them high. Electronic Bibles. Let me see those, please. Well done, y'all. Well done. Tell you what, the next time you sing the song, Look What the Lord Has Done, <laughs> you're going to have a whole nother perspective. Learning to be fearless. Second attempt. <laughs> Only people in no excuses understand what second attempt is. Other people look at that and go, what in the world is he talking about? Well, I wasn't able to do it last week. So um, I'm going to condense in a little bit for you just because I, I'm so grateful that we made time for those testimonies. That was phenomenal. How many of you were encouraged just by hearing the testimonies of what God did? That's amazing. You know, when times are good, we still need wisdom to not abuse God's goodness in our life. And I think a great illustration of that is the story of Joseph when he rose to prominence and power, second in all of the world. And uh, Pharaoh had a dream, and he had the interpretation and said, listen, there's going to be seven years of plenty and seven years of lack or famine. And so for those seven years, they, they lived off of a, per a, a percentage, excuse me, and then took another percentage, and they put that away so that they would have food for the lean years. And that's what I'm talking about when I say we need wisdom when times are good. We don't need to presume on the goodness and grace of God and just think that just because we can come to no excuses and the presence of God fills the house and people are getting healed and, and falling over like flies and things are what so it just doesn't matter. I can always just go there and get blessed. Listen, there, there are seasons even in the spirit realm. So when you find seasons of refreshing, you need a drink for all your worth. You understand what I'm saying? You need, you need to be a spiritual sponge and soak up everything that you can. Soak up encounters, experiences, the presence of God, the words of God, uh, what the presence of God, whatever it is that, that you find yourself in the midst of that flow, you need to receive everything that you can because there, there's seasons where we, ha we, we have to walk. What does the Bible say? We walk by faith and not by, let me put it another way. We walk by faith and not by feeling. We walk by faith and not emotion. So I like it when faith and feeling and emotion are all lined up. That's, ah, that's, woohoo, you know, that's phenomenal. But it's not always that way. And sometimes what God is speaking to us by faith is contrary to what's happening in the natural. Oh, ah. There was nothing in my life at the time that I received that prophetic word. The things you said you'd never do, that's what you're going to do. I was not sized up, lined up, prepared for, or anything becoming a pastor. Yet God spoke a word in a, a, a drought season in that sense that changed everything. Because of a word spoken here, it germinated. And watch, it changed my mind and it changed my emotions about the whole thing. Our problem is we want to think that God can or should or whatever, and then we got to feel the presence of God, right? So it's got to be emotional. So we got to have our head right and our emotions right before we'll let him in our spirit. But many times God has to bypass that because if we're waiting on this to get in line, it never will. Y'all didn't hear any of that. You can't wait on the flesh to get in line with the spirit. So God speaks directly to our spirit many times in a prophetic word, and that word germinates and then causes a realignment to come up through our emotions and our mind. Does that make any sense to anybody? So when things are good and provision is there, we need to be wise about it. One of the ways that we can be wise is in the midst of any situation, the Bible says we should give thanksgiving. We ought to thank him. The Bible says in Psalm 92, verse 1, it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. We see elsewhere, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Why do we just take time this evening to deal with these testimonies? Because I do not want us to forget his benefits. I don't want us to forget that people have been healed physically and emotionally and spiritually and, and, and in every way. I want us to remember. How many has ever cooked a roast? Do you just slap the stuff in there and then when it's done, it's done? Or do you take that ladle and you're constantly bathing that roast? Huh? That's what we got to do with the anointing. We've got to constantly base our life in the anointing of God, the presence of God, the testimonies of God. 
it's important that we stay in that seasoning. And Thanksgiving is a wonderful way to make that happen. In James chapter 1, verse 17, it says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And then we find in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, it says, In everything give thanks, for that this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Not because of everything we give thanks. I'm not going to thank God that I got a broke leg or thank God that I'm broke as a joke. Or, but in the midst of having a broke leg or in the midst of being you know, broken financially, I'm going to say, God, you're faithful then, you're faithful now. I celebrate today your goodness, your faithfulness in my life. And I know what it looks like and I know what it feels like, but I know in my knower that you're better than all of this. Does that make sense? And that sounds great until you wake up one morning and you don't feel like praying and you don't feel like reading and you don't feel like praising and you don't feel like thanking. You don't feel like being around these weird people up with no excuses that you know is going to hug on you and kiss on you and slobber on you and, and all that. You don't want to be around all that. Why? Because I'm, I'm sulking right now. I'm, I'm really basting myself in all of the nonsense that's happening in my life so that I don't have room for God. Do you know that's why we worship the way that we worship and that's why we praise the way we praise? Because when we come into this, into this room from being outside and being, dealing with life, we're like a sponge. And somehow when we're worshiping God, it squeezes all of the junk out of our life. And then as we begin to suck back in, we're sucking in the life of God. You, you see what I'm saying? So you can't even get yourself squeezed out if you're not thanking him and praising him and loving him and worshiping him and honoring him no matter what's going on. A fool can worship God when things are going great, but it takes a real person of faith and, and valor in the things of God that when things look like they're going to hell in a handbasket, I'm still thanking and praising Jesus. Does that make sense? Have there been some things going right in your life? Then thank God for that. Have you recently experienced some successes? Give him some thanks for that. Have things been going wrong in your life here lately? Thank God in the midst of it. You know, God doesn't need our affirmation. That's not what the Thanksgiving's about. But thanks keeps our focus right. <laughs> Listen, I remember as a kid, no matter what was given to me, I don't care if it was a dum-dum at the barber shop. I don't care if it was an ice cream cone at the, at, the, at the corner store. I don't care if it was a toy. My parent, what do you say? Son, what do, what do you say? I didn't feel thankful. It's a paper toy. I just do not have it. Come on. But I was taught, watch, to express thanks even when I didn't mean it. I'm going to try this side. Because the first way to mean it is to say it. See, we like to wait until we mean it before we say it. Sometimes I got to say it before I mean it. Y'all ain't hearing anything at all. So listen, I know he's faithful even when I feel like he's not. So when my emotions are saying, God's abandoned me, I ain't got enough money, we're not going to get by this month, things have gotten really rough, family's all messed up, job's all messed up, car's all messed up, church's all messed up, I just don't know about all this stuff, there still needs to be, I need to, I need to remember, see I remember his faithfulness. He never, ever, ever forsook me. And since I have all of this history that he's never forsaken me, I can now have faith to believe he won't forsake me now no matter what it feels like. So I have to reach deep and say, Lord, I thank you. Not that I'm going through the mess, but that even in the midst of the mess, you're still king, you're still Lord, you're still faithful, you're still righteous, you're still holy. You still got my back whether I feel like you do or not. So I thank you today that you're my God. Does that make sense to anybody? See, we like to wait until we, we just feel good before we start thanking God. No, you thank God when you don't feel good, and your emotions and everything else will line up with that. So I'm going to focus for just a minute on times of crisis. When you're in the midst of a crisis, you ought to be digging in the Word of God for His counsel. You know what we do when we get in a crisis? We do like the game show. We dial a friend. What do you think I should do? 
What do you think I should do? Here, here's one. I, I ain't been hearing from God. You ain't been hearing from God because you ain't been talking to God. But I ain't been hearing from God, so I need you to pray, and you tell me what God's saying about what I should do. Huh? See, y'all looking all holy right now. Some of y'all called me over that very thing, so don't be looking holy right now. I love the fact that we have practical instruction and wisdom that comes from experts. We need that. But right now, we're being inundated with all kinds of information. The Bible says that a wise man will weigh counsel. I think that's important. We should weigh counsel. Listen, there's times that I need counsel from the medical field. You got, listen, I use doctors. I use them. How many ever taken a car to a mechanic shop to get a diagnostic? And when you got the diagnostic, you took it home and fixed it yourself. That's what I do with doctors. I pay them for a diagnostic. Tell me what's broke. Oh, fatty liver? Thank you. Father, I command this liver in the mighty name of Y'all hear what I'm saying? I go home, I take care of myself. I use the doctors to diagnose it, but I use the physician to fit. Y'all ain't hearing anything at all. Listen, we, we should have counsel. I, I, I believe in that. Here's the problem. Sometimes when we need godly counsel, we go to natural experts. And there's sometimes that godly counsel flies in the face of natural experts. Remember, a blind man came to Jesus. He spit in the dirt. Made little mud marbles. Stuck in his eyeballs. And said, See. Now, you tell me what physician would say, I'm prescribing spittle in dirt, roll into little marble balls, force into open eyeballs, and command sight. You, you catch what I'm saying? When the apostle tax time came and he didn't have the money, Jesus didn't say get a fourth job. He said, hey, there's a, there's a fishing hole right over there. Go wet a hook. He didn't even say to bait it. God had already prepared the money that happened to be in the mouth of a fish, and he had that fish just sitting in the water waiting on a bare hook to get dropped right in front of him. You catch what I'm saying? He didn't have to bait the hook. He probably just got him a limb, you know, Boom, pulled it out, took the money, tossed the fish back, and the fish was singing praises all the way back to his family. God used me today to pay Peter's taxes, glory. Y'all, have a little imagination when you read the Word of God. It really is important who you go to to counsel. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, verse 6, in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. But if you only go to people that know how you see things and you know they're always going to agree with your viewpoint, then are you really going for counsel or are you just trying to justify your position? As long as we're asking for counsel, we need to ask God who to reach out to for counsel. Because many times God will send us to somebody who don't think like us. He's going to have a different point of view than us. See, if you're in a bind financially, morally, ethically, socially, there's a lot of different ways to look at things. And a lot of people say, get a hold of a lawyer. Well, that a lawyer will probably give you advice on how what? To protect yourself, right? How to protect your assets, how to protect your, your personal safety. They're going to give you some real wisdom how to, how to do that in the legal system. But that may or may not be God's solution for you. See, if protecting yourself legally exposes others or puts others in jeopardy or in harm's way, that may not be the path that God is calling you to take. Now, hear me. It still might be. The point I'm making is that if you go to counsel, 
from those that are trained in the law, then don't be surprised when they give you advice that's based in the law. I'm just saying in the multitude of counsel, be sure you get some spiritual guidance and not always just financial or legal or medical. You know, I also appreciate insight that comes from the prophetic. If you've been in this house for any length of time, you know we typically have about three times a year where we bring in prophetic voices that are seasoned. You understand what I mean when I say seasoned? They're not novices. They're not new at it. They've been doing this for decades. I believe that the, prof- the prophets as, a, as an office, as well as prophetic gifts and mantles, they're valid gifts for the church. So remember Peter's words of the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 17. And it shall come to pass on the last day, says God, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. How many of you are flesh? He's going to pour out his spirit on you. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. There's that word. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. So the scripture tells us to despise not prophecy and despise not prophesying first thessalonians chapter 5 verse 20 do not scorn or reject gifts of prophecy or prophecies spoken revelations words of instruction or exhortation or warning verse 21 but test all things carefully so you can recognize what is good hold firmly to that which is good abstain from every form of evil and withdraw and keep away from it And you say, well, how is prophecy bad or wrong? I'm so glad you asked. We're getting there. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, pursue this love with eagerness and make it your goal, yet earnestly desire and cultivate spiritual gifts to be used by believers for the benefit of the church, but especially that you may prophesy. Verse 29, Let two or three prophets speak as inspired by the Holy Spirit while the rest pay attention and weigh carefully what is said. Why do we need to weigh it if it's a prophecy? Let me tell you why. Because it's easy for the vessel called the prophet or the person with the prophetic gift to inject their own opinion or their own slant. That's why, listen, I keep going back to this because it's, it's, it's still fresh in my life. But when Dennis released that word over me, the things you said you'd never do, that's what you're going to do. You guys got to understand, for many years I've said, I'm, not, I'm never going to pastor. Don't even ask me. I'm not doing that. Forget it. It's off the table. I want no part with that. This has been going on for years. He didn't know me at all. So when he said, the things you said you'd never do, that's what you're going to do. My flesh went to like, what's up, man? Come on now. You know that ain't right. But my spirit my spirit celebrated that word. And I'm like, what are you doing? Shut up, man. <laughs> Come on. So the spirit of God on the inside of me was saying yes and amen to the word that came prophetically from God through a person. You catch what I'm saying? So when your spirit man rejoices at a word, that's when you pay attention. Verily, verily, I say unto you, you're going to be a multi-gazillionaire. Well, our head goes, woohoo, glory, right? But that's our head. If that word were accurate for your life, and I'm not saying it's not, I'm using it as an example, but if that word were accurate for your life, when you heard that word in your spirit, your spirit would feel the weight of the responsibility. Just like when my wife told me she was pregnant with Lexi. And my response was, oh, Lord. And she says, you're not happy. What I felt was the weight. How many ever picked up like two sacks of Crete? And as soon as you pick them up, it's like, oh. But once you get it, okay, yeah, I got this. Now we can go. That's what was happening. I just got saddled with two sacks of Crete in the spirit. You know what I'm saying? Just all of a sudden, hey, we're having a baby. Oh, Lord Jesus, help me. But after I came up underneath that weight and realized, okay, all right, Lord, you equipped me for this. Now I could get happy. 
Y'all hear anything I'm saying? So sometimes what we think in our head, oh, they should be rejoicing over that. Sometimes they're not rejoicing right away because the heaviness and the weight of that responsibility just came on them. That's what concerns me about people. I just want to preach. I want to pastor. There is something psychologically and spiritually wrong with you if you want to pastor. You understand what I'm saying? God has to go into your life and rewire things for you to want to. Y'all don't hear anything I'm telling you right now. He's got to rewire you to want what he wants for you. Because our whole life has been so self-centered. I just want to have a life of luxury. I want to live in a big house and drive expensive cars. I want to have money to do anything I want to do, take these wild vacations. I want to, I want to help the work of the ministry. How much do you need, brother? Use me, Lord, to fund the ministry. He can't use you to speak Jesus to somebody at the restaurant, but you want him to you. Things have to be weighed in the spirit realm. Not every word that sounds right is right, and not every word that sounds wrong is wrong. The Bible says that we have a, sure, a more sure word of prophecy. That's the scripture, 2 Peter 1, 19. You know, the Bible's been tested and proven over hundreds of years. I don't have time to prove its validity right now. I'm just saying I have seen it happen in my life so many times, and I recognize that the devil can't stand it when I read even the table of contents. Now, here's something I've been preaching for a long time, and some of you look at me a little cross-eyed like, well, you might have kind of just crossed the line right there. But I'm going to tell you this. I believe that prophecies, in most cases, are conditional. I do. Now, when you look at Revelation, and it says that there's going to be a, a big battle in Armageddon. The blood's going to run up to the horse's bridle. I, I believe that's set in stone, okay? That, that's, that's happening, okay? There's certain things that no matter what we say or do, it's not going to change the big picture of what God's bringing about. Am I making sense? However, comma, in our personal lives, I believe God gives us windows to get in line with what he said. How many are old enough to remember the big merry-go-rounds at the park, you know? Huh? And you want to get on when they first start pushing it. Because once that thing gets going, if you reach up and grab that thing, whoo, it'll rip your arm right out of socket. You know what I'm saying? Huh? I was the weirdo that was hanging on and my legs just, whoa! Huh? But you want to get on early, not late. Same way with the prophetic word. We have a lot of people saying, oh, thank you for that word. I'm going to put it up here on the shelf, and when it comes to pass, I'll be able to say that was, you missed it. You absolutely missed it. You say, okay, Joel, you get us a lot of conjecture, now give us some Bible. I'm so glad you asked. Let me do that. You know, it's so funny. Last week, I had two family members that sent me videos that just affirmed and confirmed the message. And then I had this message all prepared for Sunday. And, of course, we know that God showed up and did the miraculous. And so we celebrate all of that. But my son, unbeknown, he had no idea what the message was going to be. And he sent me a video clip that when I saw it, I was like, Phew. there it is again, affirming and confirming. So in that video clip, um, he referenced Jonah. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, we're going to leave it there, saying, go to Nineveh, that great city, great city, not a small one, great city, and proclaim judgment against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now we know it's not what he did. So now let's skip to chapter 3. So he's already been thrown in the sea, fish ate him, he stinks like tuna, got vomited up on the seashore. Chapter 3, verse 1, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, go to Nineveh, the great city, and declare to it the message which I'm going to tell you. So 
So he goes down. He says, hey, Nineveh, God going to kill you. God going to wipe you out. Your sin has got so bad, the stench has reached heaven. You're done. Verse 5. The people of Nineveh believed and trusted in God. And they proclaimed a fast and put sackcloth on their heads from the greatest even to the least of them. Verse 10. When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God had compassion and relented concerning the disaster which he had declared that he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. Let me help you because you're going, that's an awful lot of reading. God said, go prophesy and tell no excuses. I'm going to wipe them off the face of the earth because they've been disobedient. The prophet ran. Spits him out on the seashore. And God says, I'm going to tell you one more time. I said, go to no excuses. And tell him I'm going to wipe him out. That's a prophetic word. It's from God. We hear the word. We're the Ninevites. We hear the word. And we go, man, what have we done? Oh, my goodness. We've re- we got stupid. So we start a fast. And we start praying, and I don't mean the praying that's like, oh, Lord, you know, to be seen of people. It's that reach down deep and say, God, I've been an idiot. I don't know what I was doing. I don't know what I was thinking, but I sure wasn't thinking about you. I'm wrong. You're so right. Please forgive me. And God says, you know what? Changed my mind. He rip up that prophetic word. Why? Because even his prophetic word of judgment was conditional. Oh, I ain't done. I ain't done. I ain't done. Yes, but wait, there's more. See, if that works positively, and he does not bring about a judgment, then I'm confident also if he releases a prophetic word that's positive, and we shelve it or ignore it, he can change his mind on the good word too. Well, I was prophesied over in 1973 that God was going to use me to preach. It doesn't matter that I'm 96, glory, and I never preached a message in my life. I don't know, man. Your, your window might have closed. That merry-go-round spinning pretty good. See, isn't it amazing that we're so entitled that we'll take a word from God and we decide whether or not we want it? That's what concerns me about people just, I just, I just want a pastor. I just want to, I want to be an apostle. I want to be a, I want to be a prophet. I was just listening to Catherine Kuhlman today. And she said, the cost of ministry is great because it costs everything. Just for our group. This is no brag. This is just transparency. Do you know how many times I walk away from my own family because somebody needs deliverance, is in a jam, needs the word of God spoken to them, got suicidal, car broke down, needed a few bucks for something to eat? Y'all hear anything I'm saying? There's none of this. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying, do, do you understand how many times? I'm not hanging out with my son. I'm not hanging out with my daughter. I'm not on a date with my wife. And they look me up on 360 because we we track each other, right? And they go, oh, he's up at the church again. Oh, he's up at the hospital. Oh, he's up at the... And they blow it off because God's graced them with the ability to really walk in forgiveness towards me because they understand that there's a cost. You don't hear anything I'm saying. There, There is a cost. I'm 
not going to camp there. Yes, I am. I don't go where I want to go because I don't want to lead you guys astray. I don't do everything that I want to do because I don't want to give you guys creative license to take what I've done to go, 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 go above and beyond to do something really stupid. You catch what I'm saying? I got to watch what I say, where I go, who I hang with, what I post. What I say from the pulpit. What I do in the parking lot. Y'all ain't hearing anything yet. Everything that I do, I have to look at it from the standpoint of, God, I am re-presenting who you are, and I don't want to false advertise that you're okay with X, Y, or Z. There's restaurants I won't go to. There's movies I won't see. There's certain places of business that's next door to the restaurant that I'm going to that I won't park in front of that business lest somebody go by and see my truck and go, oh, I know what he's doing. He in there getting some medicine. I know what he's doing. No. I take this so seriously that when, my, when uh, years ago my mom was getting a, uh, an alarm thing put on her car and, and the alarm place was right next door to the liquor store. And there was no parking in front of the alarm place so they parked in front, right one space in front of the liquor store. What I do? And I sent it to them. I know what y'all doing. I knew better, but it was so odd. Y'all ain't hearing nothing I'm saying. The clothes I wear. There's certain brands that won't don this physique because I don't believe in what they believe in. Y'all like, ah! Y'all catch what I'm saying? So I, I, everything in my life is affected because of you. Look at Jeremiah chapter 18. <laughs> I always get a little bit different perspective tonight. <laughs> How many of y'all just already knew it all? It's all right. I mean, I'm just checking. All right, you knew it so far? Okay. We ain't done yet. Jeremiah 18, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord. It says, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will make you hear my words. <laughs> I will make you hear my words. That's kind of scary. And then I went down to the potter's house, and I saw that he was working at the wheel. But the vessel that he was working with, with, with clay was spoiled by the potter's hand, and so he made it over, reworking it and making it into another pot that seemed good to him. Verse 5, Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter does, says the Lord? Look carefully as the clay is in the potter's hand. So are you in my hand, O house of Israel. And at one moment, I might suddenly speak concerning a nation or kingdom that I will uproot and break down and destroy. And if that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, then I'll relent and reverse my decision concerning the devastation that I intended to do. He, we just saw him do that in Jonah. Verse 9, or at another time, I might suddenly speak about a nation or kingdom that I will build up or establish, and if they do evil in my sight by not obeying my voice, then I will reverse my decision concerning the good with which I had promised to bless them. Do you catch what he's saying? He's saying, I've released prophetic words, and I've said over one, I'm going to destroy you, but they repented, and so I changed my mind. And then I've said over to another, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to lift you up, and I'm going to use you in ministry, but you acted a fool and got stupid. So I, re I reverse that too. You ain't going to be carrying my name. You're going to be acting like that. So just because the prophetic word is released does not mean it's going to come to pass because more times than not, it's conditional on, on the recipient of that word. It's like you're getting married. I promise to have a hold. Blah, 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 blah. Well, I ain't going to be good to them. They cheated on me. I'm going to cheat on them. You see where I'm at? Listen, we got married to Jesus, and he ain't a cheater. Yeah. 
everybody in here has got a natural curiosity about the future. That's, why, that's one reason why we love the prophetic so much. We want to hear what God has in store for us. But again, we got to stay in line with his will, plan, and purpose for our life. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret thing belongs to the Lord our God, but the things which are revealed and disclosed belong to us and to our children forever so that we, we may do all the words of the law. Those of you that have had your nose in the book or heard enough preaching over your life, you know how this, this world is going to end up. We know what it looks like in the end. We're given a framework for how things are going to begin to look and ultimately end up. But then we're also given instruction on how we're supposed to live. Attitudes that we're supposed to cultivate in our hearts. Behaviors that are right and not wrong. Behaviors that are wrong, we got to stay away from. In Psalm 46, verse 2, the psalmist makes a declaration. He says, therefore, we will not fear. You know how many Christians right now looking at the election, looking at the economy, looking at their investments, looking at their jobs, looking at the, the economy as a whole, looking at the possibility of war. I mean, are you guys aware that before Biden gave his, his, his speech yesterday, that our jet fighters intercepted both Russian and Chinese Air, Air Force in our airspace? Testing us. You know how many Christians get in bed at night? Huh? The Bible says as believers... Our faith and our hope and our trust is not in who's president, not who the government is, not where, where the finances are, not where our investments are at, not what neighborhood we live in, not what cars we drive. Our faith and our hope and our trust is in him. Therefore, I will not fear. That's why the more they scream, the more I honor God. The more they say you can't go to church, the more I go to church. Y'all ain't hear nothing I'm saying. We never closed during COVID, and this next whatever they're bringing along, we ain't going to close for that either. You know, isn't it crazy? We're growing. We grew during COVID. And now we're in the middle of the summer slump where churches are just like, you know, and we're growing in the midst of the summer slump. Uh. Why do we choose not to fear? Number one, in this house, we understand that 2 Timothy 1 7 tells us what fear is. Fear is a spirit. And I'm just not going to cohabitate and roommate with fear. Not going to do it, okay? Number two, fear torments the mind. In 1 John 4 18, it says, There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. But perfect, complete, full grown love drives out fear because fear involves the expectation of divine punishment, so that the one who is afraid of God's judgment is not perfected in love, has not grown into a sufficient understanding of God's love. 1 John 4 18. Let's see if I can put that in our own vernacular fear only has place to germinate in your life when you mistrust god when you don't believe what he says when you don't believe historically what he's done when your feeler stops feeling and your prophesier stops prophesying and you feel alone, rejected, dejected, isolated, insulated, and unwanted, then we start distrusting or mistrusting God. And the moment I stop trusting him, fear wants to take its place. I don't believe that there's really any empty space in our lives. It's either occupied by God or by that thing that's not God. Right. 
So the moment we mistrust God, it opens up space for what's not God to take over. But when we choose to believe him, regardless of how we feel and what we see, that space is vacated and God can take that. I guess what I'm saying is we're constantly real estate that's going between two owners. And when we find ourselves owned by the enemy, we're desolate, unfruitful, rocky. And when God is in control of our life and owns our real estate, we have streams of water, nice vegetation, good weather. Problems come when you blame God for what the devil did and you give credit to the devil for what God did. That's why the pews in churches are not filled because people have been, been giving credit to the wrong entity. Here's the fix for fear. It's the fix. Only removal is effective. Only removal. And removal is only possible through trust. So we are encouraged to trust in God because he's love. The Bible says perfect love. What's perfect love? God casts out all fear. So if you do not or cannot trust God, then there is no fear removal available to you. I was telling my son recently, I pointed at the building where I was diagnosed with a appendicitis and uh, I was in a lot of pain I mean like double over pain we knew the problem but we were helpless to fix it so I had to trust my dad's wisdom who consequently trusted a doctor he had never met who put us in touch with a surgeon we had never met to put me artificially to sleep to take a knife and open my body pull out an organ remove it sew me up without infection in order to save my life. And we have more faith in people with a skill set because we pay them for their expertise than we do in the God that gave them the wisdom to have the expertise who's willing to give us all that he is for all of us. So you're going to trust a human who might be a cheating, stealing, conniving, angry, bitter, possessed individual to tamper with your body in a way that no other human ever has, and you can't trust God to set you free? People do stupid things when they're driven by fear. You ever see those video clips? Somebody standing around the corner. Rah! Ah! They wind up hitting them with a frying pan. or 
The children of Israel did not go into the promised land when they should have because of fear. Peter denied the Lord because of fear. And as believers, we have a fight or flight mentality. That's why we have to learn when you've done all that you know how to do to stand, stand. Don't lose any ground. Stand firm. Don't run. As soon as you run, you give up what you fought for. So as far as you get in God, this is as far as you go, and fear is coming at you, stand firm. Don't give any space. Proverbs 28, verse 1, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous is bold as a lion. I'm skipping. The way that some people try to find peace is to deny reality. I'm going to say that again. The way some people are trying to find peace is to deny reality. I want you to hear that denial is not faith. Denying that you have pain is not faith. Denying that your relationship is jacked up is not faith. Faith is strong enough to handle facts. <laughs> Listen, when Lazarus died, Jesus showed up and said, Yep, Lazarus is dead. He didn't say, oh, he's sleeping. He's been sleep, taking a dirt nap for four days. Huh? He didn't say, oh, y'all made this up. He didn't deny the fact that Lazarus was dead. And stating that Lazarus was dead as a fact did not adversely impact his authority, his power, or his call. I need you to hear that just because you state a fact does not mean that faith takes a back seat to that. Just like I use doctors to find out what's, what's broken so I can believe God for the fix, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. You hear so-and-so passed away or you got a, you got a migraine. How you feeling? And you don't want to say, well, I believe I've got a, I've got a migraine because you're afraid that you're giving the devil access. Listen, the devil's already messing with you or you wouldn't be having a migraine. So all you did was expose it. You know what, you know what happens when, when, when predators mess with children? They say, don't you say nothing. If you say anything, I'm going to hurt your mom and daddy. Huh? Why? They want to keep them silent because they know if they get exposed they in trouble what do you think the devil's trying to do don't you tell them you go to migraine you're gonna look so weak in the spirit they're gonna make fun of you at that church huh oh some of y'all just ding ding starting to get it now when you state the fact remember faith is over facts faith does not bow its knee to facts 5,000 people out there, they're hungry. There ain't no restaurant or drive through you can go to. Jesus says, feed them. They find a young boy with five loaves and two fish. They come to Jesus and say, this is all we got. He said, okay, that'll do. Huh? So the Lord gave thanks. What well, we've been talking about this, this evening. He gave thanks, broke it, go feed them. Broke it again, go feed them. Broke it, go feed them. Broke it, go feed them again. Broke it, go feed them. Broke it. You catch what I'm saying? Five loaves, two fish, fed 5,000. That's just the men. Add women and children. You catch what I'm saying? The fact is there was no food. But faith said no problem. The fact is you may have a migraine. Faith says no problem. The fact is you might have a bad diagnosis. Faith says no problem. Your relationship might be on the rocks, and that's a fact jack, but faith says that's no problem. Faith is not intimidated by facts. Facts are intimidated by your faith. The Bible says that the bad things happen to good people and bad people. It rains on the righteous and the unrighteous alike, the Bible says. 
So it happens in both of our lives. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 15, the way of the transgressors is hard. Romans 8, 22 says, we know that all creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. And then in verse 23, not only that, but we also, who had the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan. See, the godly and the ungodly are all groaning. I'm skipping a lot. Psalm 46, verse 1 also says, God is our strength. I want you to hear this statement. If you're taking notes, write this down. You don't have to be strong to be safe. You do not have to be strong to be safe. But you do need to be covered. You do not have to be strong to be safe. But you do need to be covered. The Bible says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. That's Proverbs 18.10. Psalm 34.17, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears and he delivers them out of all of their troubles. How many of their troubles? All of their troubles. Last point, and then I want to pray for you. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 8, it says, The Lord sent a word against Jacob, and it has fallen on Israel. All the people will know, Ephraim and the inhabitant of Samaria, who say, in pride and arrogance of heart. I'm going to pause here for just a second. I want you to hear this. There's a number of people, even in this house, some that I'm dealing with presently, that are prideful and arrogant in their heart. And I want you to understand, until you willingly lay that down, you are not a candidate for the blessing of God. Because for God to bless you in a prideful and arrogant condition is to applaud you and to... Sort of... Um, boy, that word just left me. To applaud you, to bless you, to encourage you for doing wrong. If I tell my kids stay out of the cookie jar, and I come back in there, and they're in the cookie jar, I'm not going to say, oh, pff, eat them all. I'm going to beat them and say, I told you to stay out of my cookies. Huh? You hear what I'm saying? Then I'm going to make another batch, and they can't have that one either. Verse 10, the bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild the hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. Verse 11, Therefore, the Lord shall set up the adversaries of resin against him and spur his enemies, the Syrians before the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. See, in the judgment of God that he was having them fall for the, before the Syrians and the Philistines, it was to humble them so they would say yes to God. I'm going to condense this so you'll get it real quick. Some of y'all have been blaming the problems you're having in your life on the devil. And you don't understand that some of the problems that you're in right now, God brought into your life because he wants you to cry out to him. But you're so busy thinking that you got it all together, there ain't nothing you can't handle. So you're trying to fix it yourself. So God sends some more problems into your life in order to try to cripple you to make you cry out to God and say, Lord, help me. He said, thank you. I've been asking for this for a long That's what I've been trying to get you to do the whole time. So some of y'all been blaming the devil. Man, that devil be chasing me, and he's all over me, and oh my goodness, things have gotten so bad. Ain't the devil. Sometimes that's God. And you're too, mm -hmm, to, to understand it. You, you catch what I'm saying? So oh my goodness, what we've been learning about God today. He changes his mind. He'll say one thing and do another based on our response. And then God so wants to be a part of our life that if we're willingly ignoring him, he'll send a little calamity into our life to make us cry out to him. Why? Because he knows if you handle everything on your own, you ain't never going to talk to him. He wants a relationship. Listen, that's like, that's like me wanting to hang out with my wife and, and she's too busy, right? So you know what I do? I'll disable the Jeep. So I'll get a phone call. Hey, Jeep won't start. Are you kidding? When did that start happening? Just now, I don't understand it. 
Well, you just hang on. I'll be right there. See, some of y'all looking at me like, no, he did. I'm not sure. Did he do it? Rachel, did he? But this is what God does. He, he sets us up so that we need to cry out to him. What would happen to our relationship if she called somebody else to come fix the Jeep? Then the next time I might make sure there ain't no money in the account. Hey! I tried to go down to Olive Garden and wasn't no money in the account. Oh, are you there now? Yeah, and they won't let me leave. Well, you just hang on. I'll be there in a minute. Y'all ain't hearing nothing. See, y'all been blaming God. Oh, this bad stuff been happening. And have you been talking to him? Have you been loving on him? Have you been appreciating him? Have you been asking for his insight? Have you been asking for his wisdom? Have you been asking for his involvement in your life? <laughs> y'all say, I don't know about this. I didn't know God was that way. I just, I'm not sure. Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me, and when you search for me with your whole heart, I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I'll bring you back from your captivity. I feel like I just need to prove this point. Isaiah 9, verse 13, for the people do not turn to him who strikes them, nor do they seek the Lord of hosts. Do you hear that? The people do not turn to him who strikes them. Who's the him that strikes them? God. They're not turning to God when he's bringing calamity into their life. Deuteronomy 32, verse 39. Now see that I, even I am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Nor is there anyone who can deliver from my hand. I'm just blowing some of y'all's minds. You're going, I didn't know God was that way. Psalm 46.10, and I'm done. Be still and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I'm God. Confidence in God is our foundation to weather any storm. Psalm 46.10. So I'm going to tell you, there's a difference between not living in fear and pretending to not live in fear. And there needs to be a goodbye before there can be a hello. You're going to have to say goodbye to fear before there's hello to faith. Nothing is too difficult for you as long as you have him living in you. Fearless is what we become when we learn to fully trust in God. Fearless is what we become when we fully learn how to trust in God. See, some of you right now have been working so hard to try to fix stuff yourself. And you haven't asked for God's help. You haven't asked for his wisdom. You haven't asked him who you needed to call for expertise in your situation. You've been, you've been playing Zorro, Lone Ranger, Superman, Wonder Woman. You've been trying to do it all yourself. And God's been allowing, hmm, for some of you, he might be causing some issues in your life just to get you to cry out to him. How about we just solve it all and decide, Lord, I'm just going to cry out to you. I'm not sure what's going on in my life. I'm not sure if the devil brought this, you brought this, I brought this. I don't know. All I'm saying is I ain't happy with where I'm at and what's going on, and I need your involvement in my life. So would you please give me instruction? Would you please give me wisdom? Would you please hook me up with the right people that will speak God's word into my life? Will you speak in a way that my spirit will rejoice even if my flesh gets upset? I'm okay with my flesh being upset. I am. Do you know that that's why many times I'll release a word that I know is going to make some people mad this way, but I know it's going to set them free this way? So I'll make this mad all day long in order to make this free. You catch what I'm saying? All day, every day. Won't even think twice about it. Because I'll be honest with you, some of you are so that the only way I'm ever going to get to the core of what's going on is to hack you off. 
Guys, I'm not saying this just because I'm pastoring. When I was a youth pastor, I used to say this. If your pastor's not hacking you off at least a couple of times a year, he's probably not your pastor. Because if all you're ever getting is fist bumps and high fives and how you doing, ooh, it's good to see you. If that's all you're ever getting, how are you ever going to grow? 